to talk, he cannot move it, and there is no storm to God. carry you. And uh, praise the Lord. Thank you for that wonderful truth. Man, I hope, I hope your heart has been stirred in our song service. God is here. And I hope you have not been in a mood. I feel like I need to uh, whisper to some of you out there, it's okay to smile. Amen? It's okay to smile in church. Uh, put your happy face on. Jesus is here. And it's okay to be happy in the Lord. Amen? And uh, when you get the victory in Jesus, you can have a smile that he puts on your face. And I'm thankful, and I'm thankful that he can uh, speak to us before his words ever open. And uh, he can certainly minister to us through song, and he has done that this morning. Take your Bible and go to Romans chapter 6. Uh, Romans chapter 6, no place I'd rather be in the house of God. Amen? And I thank you for your faithfulness to be here and uh, your involvement, your participation in, in the service so far uh, this morning. Romans chapter 6 is where we're going to be. And uh, we have been going through on Sunday mornings a series of victorious Christian living. And uh, we have talked about several things that Christians uh, face and, and struggle with on a regular basis. Temptation, stress, and, and adversity, and, and the giants in our life, different things that we've gone through. And, man, I've been encouraged to see how God uh, not only can, but how God wants to and will uh, give us the victory over those areas um, in our life. 
Uh, but you know, sometimes it's good, uh, Brother Pavel, just to reach back and to, to preach on um, a, a three-letter word, a nasty three-letter word that gives you and I a lot of problems. A lot of people don't like it because when you get to a service like this, uh, you get to toe stomping a little bit. Folks get uncomfortable a little bit, Brother Lynn. Well, it's like Grandma said, if you can't handle the heat, then you better get out of the kitchen. Amen? It's good sometimes just to rear back and preach on sin. Every one of us struggle with it. None of us is above it. Every one of us commit it. Hopefully, every one of us here that knows Jesus Christ, if you know Jesus Christ, you've been delivered from it. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning, having, having victory over that. But, uh, you know, in Romans 8, we looked at um, how, how, how the victory we can have over the penalty of sin. You know, some great verses in Romans chapter 8, uh, verse 1, there's now no condemnation to them which know God. Praise the Lord, we have the victory over the penalty of sin. But here, Paul talks about something different. He says that we, in chapter 6, can have the victory over the power of sin. If we're talking about sin, we'll be glorified one day and have victory over the penalty of sin, but right now, here and now, we can have the victory over the power of sin. Man, it's a powerful thing um, that we struggle with and we face in our uh, life, and, and many call this passage a very challenging and tough passage, and I have to say as a preacher, it, it is. It is a very deep theological passage, but that is not my intent this morning, is to, to sit us in the theology class, but there's some things here in this, in this passage, some truth, some awesome helps for for us that we need to talk about uh, this morning. Every person, when you get saved, understand something. Uh, uh, every person, when you get saved, you immediately become justified. We immediately become justified. Justification takes place at salvation. But understand there's also another word that begins at justification. Justification happens when you're saved. Sanctification begins when you get saved. But it doesn't end until glorification. So you got justification, sanctification, and glorification. Justification happens when you accept Jesus Christ into your life. Sanctification begins at that point and continues on until glorification, the day we're, we're taken to be with Jesus. And so we're going to talk about that middle part of this morning, the sanctification. And uh, here it's very obvious that many people, I love this chapter, and I love how the Lord has brought our uh, Victorious Christian Living series together with our theme for this year of growing in grace. Because we see um, Paul talk about both of them here in this chapter. Many call this chapter the Great Victory Chapter. The Great Victory Chapter. Hey, if I can get victory over sin in my life, I can have the victory. Amen? And if you can get victory over the sin in your life, you too can have the victory. Romans 6, would you stand with me? Romans 6, 1 through 14, uh, they deal with believers. I want you to know that. They deal with believers. This, Paul is not talking um, to or about the sin of unbelievers, but he's talking to Christians, but he's telling us that we can have freedom from sin's domination and from the power of sin in our life. So let's look at these verses and be encouraged in the Lord this morning. Romans 6, what shall we say then, verse 1? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Very strong words here in the Greek, God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us, as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him in baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in this of life. Do you understand what just happens there in verse 4? God compares our ability to walk in the newness of life to the power of the resurrection. So if you ever get days where you don't feel like you can, and you don't feel like you can make it, just go to the tomb, amen? Just go and look at the stone that's been rolled away, and peek inside and see it's empty, and there's a power of the resurrection, and there is power to overcome uh, the power of sin. Look at verse 5. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man, how many of you fight the old man? Look what the Bible says about him right here. Knowing this, that your old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be put away, put in, put in the back seat. That the old man and the sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead, ooh, I love this, for he that is dead is freed from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe, 
we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, now here's the point of application. Likewise, then just as we've seen the comparison of the Lord's power over death, likewise, reckon, that's an important word in the book of Romans, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ. There's two parts of that coin. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. Would you read the first part of verse 14 with me together? For sin shall not have dominion over you. Let's say that together. For sin shall not have dominion over you. Aren't you thankful for that truth? We can, we can, we can have victory over the power of sin. God, would you help us this morning? You've already stirred our hearts, and we've been blessed uh, by your, uh, your singing, your praise. We've been blessed by the reading of your word. God, I just pray right now you'll fall down on this place. You'll captivate every heart, every mind. Would you eliminate any distractions? Lord, there's someone here this morning that needs victory over sin in their life. Lord, there's someone here this morning that's struggling, that's battling, Lord, wh- whether or not they can make it, whether or not they can live the victorious Christian life. But Lord, I don't know the hearts, but you do. And so, God, I pray that your spirit will fall down on this place. And as I speak to the outer man, and you'll speak to the inner man, Lord, this morning, and you'll do the work that you want to do. Oh, God, I pray that your presence will continue to fall upon us. I pray that you'll hide me behind the cross, Lord. It's not about the message. It's about the message. And, Lord, I, I don't write the mail. I just deliver it. So, God, I pray that you'll help us all to receive your word as it's coming from your throne as it truly is. And, God, I pray that you will do the work in our hearts this morning that you desire to draw us all closer to yourself so that we, too, may be more like you. It's in your son's precious name we pray and ask these things. And amen. Thank you for so kindly standing. You may be seated. As we grow in grace this year, we must be very careful of the wrong attitude when it comes into comparison and when it comes into an intersection with this chapter. Here's the wrong attitude I'm talking about, and some of you can nod if you've heard this or even felt it at times. Here's the wrong attitude we must be careful of. Well, I know that was wrong, or I know this is wrong, or I know I need work on this area of my life, but... I'm growing in grace. I know I need to fix this. I know I need to quit doing this. I know I need to change this aspect of my life. But, preacher, none of us are perfect. I'm growing in grace. Well, I'm thankful for all growing in grace. And sadly, though, many people in Christianity have taken this unbiblical approach. They participate in their sin with the attitude that they are human and that God's grace will forgive them. Now, how many of you know, and we'll just get this out of the way and, and up on the platform this morning, how many of you know we are forgiven by God's grace? Amen. And His grace can forgive us of all of our sin, but His grace and His abundance, what Paul is saying here, and I'm going to unfold this, but what Paul is saying here is because of His abundant grace, that does not mean that we can continue to live in sin. But so many Christians take this unbiblical approach, and the problem with this statement is it's an acceptance of our sin because we have not reached glorification. Again, glorification is when our bodies will be like Him. But the truth is that we are all growing grace. Hey, we're all growing grace. And by the way, none of us are, are where we would like to be. None of us are where we should be. Amen? I need some amen right now. Let me say that again. None of us are where we should be. None of us are probably where we would like to be spiritually, and certainly none of us are where we're going to be one day, but that cannot become an excuse in our life. See, this whole sanctification, this is where the chapter gets deep, and I'm going to make it very simple for you this morning. This whole sanctification of process is us on a daily basis becoming more like Him. We can't just get saved and get justified and say, well, that's it until I get to heaven. I'll go back to it. No, no, no. That is the problem Paul deals with here. That the people were succumbing their lives and, and their selves to the power of sin. And Paul had to erase that. And this is what he's addressing here in this first chapter. So look at the first point with me this morning as we look at um, a victory over the power of sin. Notice, first of all, if we're going to have the victory, and we can have the victory. We know that. We felt that. We, we know God's Word is true. But if we're going to do that, we've got to do some simple things. Here's the first one. Avoid the false presumption. 
avoid the false presumption. Look back at the beginning of our chapter. The, 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 the chapter opens with a rhetorical question. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin? Shall we keep on sinning, Paul? Shall we keep doing the things that, that our body and our flesh and our humanity wants to do? Because grace is more abundant. Grace can continue to abound. This was a presumption that had crept in the early church. And we see here that believers in the early church were perverting the doctrine of grace. How so? They imposed upon the grace uh, that they freely received. And they said, because we freely received this grace, and it is in overabundance, then we're going to continue to live in our sin. How many of you understand that's a bad mistake? That's a bad move. That's not Bible. That's not God's way. That's not sanctification. That's not holiness. That's not Christ-like. And these early believers were saying, we're going to just continue in our sin. Listen, this is disturbing when this happens because they are basically saying that since God's grace is unlimited and will abound more and more, that they are okay in their sin. Because where they sin, bless God, God's grace is going to more and more and more abound. Now, I'm thankful that God's grace does abound. Amen? And I'm thankful that when you and I sin and we fall short and, and we go back on some commitments and some things, we, I'm thankful God's grace will always forgive our sins. Amen? But the distinction Paul is making is this cannot be, grace cannot be a license to sin. And so many Christians... Get hung up right there. Well, preacher, God's going to forgive me. God knows that I'm not perfect. God knows that I struggle with this. And so you know what? It's not that big of a deal. S-I-N will always be S-I-N. Big or little, it's always sin. And God's grace is not a license to keep continuing in that sin. So notice the two aspects of the conversation we have here. First of all, you have the argument in verse 1. The argument, their attitude was, well, shall we go on sinning in grace, Paul? Said, shall, if, if you tell us, if you taught us that God's grace is going to continue to abound and abound, that's just going to increase. The more we need it, the more it will be there. It will increase. So, Paul, in, in order to see more of God's grace, should we just go on sinning? I mean, this was their, this was their position. It's so cockeyed. It's so um, biblical here. But to understand why they're asking that, flip back one chapter. Some of you may not have to flip back a chapter, uh, depending on where it falls. It's just uh, a couple verses before. In chapter 5, the end of the chapter, verse 20. Moreover, this is Paul teaching, he said, The law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did not much more abound. So the people are taking Paul's teaching of unlimited grace and say, well, if we want more and more grace of God, then we can just keep on sinning and get more and more grace of God. And Paul says, we see their argument, but look at Paul's answer in verse 2. He says, God forbid. His answer is very uh, to the point and straightforward here. Paul is very firm in his response. He says, of course not. He says, absolutely not. That is not what the Bible's teaching. That's not what grace is, and that's not what God gives it to us for. He says, absolutely not. He says, may it never be. And he uses that very strong phrase, the strongest negation in the Greek language, I believe. And that is, God forbid. May that never happen in your life. This phrase expressed Paul's shock, even. That, that question that he received from who's he talking to here? Christians or sinners? Believers. Christians. And you kind of, Paul's kind of shocked at what? You know when you hear something, you kind of, what was that again? Say, what? Did, did that person really just say, or really just ask, well, I thought I heard, and made, made my ear was off. Let me turn it up. And Paul is, he's he shocked. He says, absolutely not. What are you talking about? Sinning more, go on in your sin so the grace may abound. He says, no, and, and you can't get any bolder or, or, or any more sure of what Paul was saying here. But he was he was upset, really, at the misunderstanding and the abuse of God's grace that these believers were taking. He has no use for even the slightest hint that grace encourages sin. God's grace never encourages sin. Amen? It frees us from sin but it never encourages sin. We die to sin. Look what he says in verse 2, God forbid. How shall we that are, what's the next three words? How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? When you're dead, you're dead. I mean, let's put this in good old English. You can't get any deader than dead. 
Come on. When you die, you die. And I read a man this week said, uh, said, man, the alcoholic, when, when, when the consequences of his sin catches up with him, it takes his body, and he dies, and he's dead. He's gone, as we say around here. He's gone. When that happens, well, again, he can't reach back out of that casket and take another shot. He won't drink no more alcohol, because when he's dead, he's dead. And Paul says, God, you can't get any better than dead. He says, what kind of question are you asking? We died to sin when we became justified in him. And when you're dead to sin, you're dead. You don't live no more in your body. But many Christians have developed this unbiblical attitude that they can live any way they want to because God's grace will cover our sins. And folks, we've got to get victory over that this morning. I don't think any of you are misunderstanding me, but let me just say this in case the handbook hears me wrong. That doesn't mean that we're never going to see it again, does it? I've already told you and got to the amen with me when I said it. None of us are where we need to be, where we like to be, where we should be, and thank God we're certainly not where we're going to be. So we're all going to fight sin. But this is talking about the license. And this, this is what it's really doing is it's trying to take a bridge over sanctification. It's trying to say, well, I'm saved, but I, I, I'm just going to keep struggling with the power of sin until I get glorified. Justification glorification. But folks, we can't bypass sanctification. It's, it's the process of our everyday living this thing out and we cannot have victory over sin in our life if we pervert the doctrine of grace by saying, well, since God will forgive me and since His grace abounds, then I'm just going to sin anyway. God forgive us. We must not presume upon His grace to justify behavior that we know is wrong. True justification, as I mentioned, after the salvation but listen to this, the quote, true justification will always produce true sanctification. True justification will always produce true sanctification. But Jimmy, can I say it this way? When you get saved, you got to get it right. This doesn't mean that you're going to be perfect. This doesn't mean that you're not going to struggle this week. This old flesh and this old humanity and this old sin nature, the old man is a person. But Paul says that old man has been crucified. And true, just when somebody gets saved, they have power or victory over the power of sin. Doesn't mean they don't sin, but they don't struggle with sin. They say, Well, God, let me be you. But thank God I love you. No, Paul blows that out of the water. And by the way, Person growing in grace, we're talking about way. That's our theme this year. But after 2016 is over, we, we need to continue growing in grace. Amen. A person growing in grace is becoming more like Jesus. You don't have to raise your hand on this one. I just realized we all have got to fall this together. Becoming more like the Lord, which is not, again, that's a lifelong goal. And as we grow in grace, it always, 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 Get a hold of this, write it down. Remember, as we grow in grace, it always produces godliness and sanctification. Life. If we're not growing in grace, and we're not working ourselves down the ladder of this sanctification process, then we see a change. Paul says, God forgives us. God forgives us. He says, You've got to avoid that false presumption. Second of all, he says, You've got to accept our Father. Avoid the false presumption that you can keep on sinning. And second of all, accept our Father's position. Look at verses 3 and 5. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized in Jesus Christ were baptized unto his death? Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father. Here's the connection. Even so, even so, we also should walk in newness of life. For if I have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Oh, the beautiful picture. Oh, the beautiful truth that is here in this passage that Paul gives us. And it could be the thing that helps us. That this alone could be the thing. When we realize we've got to accept our Father's position, this could be the, the thing that helps us get the victory over the sin in our life. Look at 
all the times Paul says, I in him or with him. In fact, I challenge you to do this. This afternoon, sometime this week, go back through this passage and underline and highlight, if you don't mind, all the times that you see the phrase, in him or with him. In him or with him. And just notice the emphasis Paul is giving. You see, the picture that he gives here is a very practical and provided illustration, and that is a baptism. That is the baptism, and we know what baptism stands for, a physical, but we also got to see um, the reach, how it reaches out spiritually and gives us a wonderful, a wonderful example. Baptism here has the idea of identification. You with me? Baptism has the idea of identification. The word literally means uh, to plunge, to immerse, or to be done. Now, those were the skiing with us this weekend. We learned something about the plunge, didn't we? All right, there on the tube, and, the, and we all took a plunge, but we didn't quite take a plunge like it's talk, Paul's talking about here. We know that baptism is by immersion in a complete covering to fully dunk, uh, to explain what happens there. And this is a powerful symbol of the means God has given us, listen, to gain the victory over the sin. If you can hear us, and we try to mic when we have baptism, we say, very. As they're going down, buried in the likeness of his grave. Okay? So right there. Now, we know salvation and the old man is not washed away by the water. Amen? I saw it happen. That's just baptism is an outward expression of what's already took place in the inside. But this is an illustration. Baptism is an illustration that hey, we have buried ourselves in the likeness of his death. We're getting rid of the old man. We're putting him to death. We're, we're crucifying him, as the Bible says. It pictures the fact that we are now dead to the old man. And again, that begins at justification. That begins at salvation. And when that happens in the baptismal, it's just a picture of that. But the old man and his evil ways are now dead in Jesus. We have got to live that out, church family. We have got to accept the Father's position, and before we can accept the in Him and the with Him, the old Him has to be buried. He's got to be crucified. We've got to put Him to a complete death. But then notice how the illustration goes on, because baptism certainly doesn't stop there, amen? It also pictures the resurrection process. When we bring an individual up, as they go down, we say, buried in the likeness of His death, and then coming up, we say, well, by the way, the coming up part is an important part. Amen? Ever been in church where a preacher baptized somebody and just kept them there? The feet start coming up, kicking, water starts going everywhere. Instead of, hey, it's an important part to bring them back up. Amen? And so we say, in the power of his resurrection. And we bring them back up. And just as no preacher, uh, hopefully, will not, unless he's not liking somebody else, just in case a preacher would put somebody down in the water and not bring them up, he said, my great, get that person out of the water, get them up, get them up. But spiritually, how many Christians do we have laying under the water? Paul says, hey, the old man is dead. He has been crucified. But the illustration he gives the baptism is saying, because, hey, this is the pivotal point for our victory. If you ever feel, I can't do it, I can't make it, I can't conquer the sin, yes, you can. Why? Because Jesus conquered the grave. Amen? And he says, just as he was buried and is dead, now he is alive. And when we get saved, we're justified. And the sanctification process begins. And we are to become more and more like Jesus every day. And when we realize that the old man is buried, we are in him. We are in him. Look at verse 5 the illustration God wants to give us. For if we have been planted, the word planted there is an interesting word. And there's two, there's two um, illustrations I can give you. One is um, that there's actually a plant that uh, the, 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 the story behind it is that there's, no, there's not a good root system. And we've talked about a lot about roots in the last 12, 14, 13 months, but there's not a lot of root systems. But under the ground, Father, what this man will do is go reach out and it'll intertwine itself with other plants like it. Can't grow anywhere. It can't grow alone. It grows more than one. But it has to underground and reach out and intertwine with other like minded, if you will, plants. And then when we see, then as it sprouts up and grows up, guess what it does above ground? It reaches out and it intertwines the same plants that are the ground. And so that when the winds come and the sins come and the tough times come, it has the strength 
hey, listen, we're intertwined with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We are in Him. We are with Him. Just like Siamese twins. Hey, listen, they're co joined inside, they're co joined outside. Amen. Any way you look at them, any way they come, they're always together. And we'll get ourselves intertwined with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the author of this book that I'm telling you, we will have victory over the power of sin. Quick, if we keep trying to branch out on a whole, if we keep trying to say, well, I'm just this flesh, I'm just this sin, I'm just, yes, you can. Yes, you can have victory over our sin. Thirdly, I want to say, avoid the false presumption of his step. The Father's glory is position that he gives us the third one. And the Father's favor. If we're going to have victory, Played with a little bit. I don't recommend playing with your sin. But he had it in those long, that kind of super serious cover. They were long. He didn't get covered that thing. They were long. Okay. But he had that thing around his neck. Let me tell you something. We need to have the Father's name. It, it's been done at Calvary, but we need to get the victory. Our old man, our old sin, just like the head of that snake, needs to be completely cut off. Needs to be abolished. We've got to abolish our fatal. Yes, look at verses 6 through 10 quickly. Knowing this, that our old man is what? Crucified with him. There's one of the phrases you go ahead and underline. Crucified with him, that the body of sin might be. I had you say it earlier. Say it with me again. The body of sin might be destroyed, utterly destroyed, wiped out, not put to the side, not put around where you can reach out and grab it, but completely gone. Look at verse 8. Now if we, he's saying, now you're dead with Christ, then we believe that we shall also Live with him. Go back to verse 7. For he that is dead is free from sin. If you agree with the statement, or, or, or in order to say yes, say amen when I ask this. Are you saved? Did the old man die? Come on, that was weird. Let's try that again. Let's, let's get on this side. Are you saved? When you got saved, did the old man die? Then are you free from sin? Does that mean we're going to live perfection until we get to heaven? No! <laughs> Trick question. No! But we're free from the power of sin. Now, I'm telling you, Paul got hung up here, and I can get hung up here because so many Christians are trying to live the victorious Christian life, but they're still wearing chains. And they're walking around, and they don't seem to be getting anywhere with Jesus because they haven't realized the freedom that we have in Jesus. And we haven't truly abolished the fatal past, our sin nature. That old man, listen, in this chapter alone, ten times it's referred to as being dead to sin, being dead to sin, being dead to sin. Listen, we are more than conquerors, and because we accepted the Father's position at justification, then we can have power over the victory of sin. And if Paul's getting any message across here, it is to realize we are dead to the old man. We are dead to the old sin nature. Ten times here he gets the message across really clear that being in Christ we are dead to sin. And listen, forever dead. Amen? Forever dead. Ain't going to get him dead. No alcohol is going to reach out after he's dead and take another drink. Therefore, we can have the power over sin. Think about the process of burying someone. You see, the mind goes to uh, the last family that we did, my grandmother, and we gathered around that graveside service, and I had the honor of, uh, with all the preachers in the family, I, I felt really honored. I was able to give the message there at the graveside. And then we stood around afterwards, and the, the men came in after the, they'd asked if it was okay, and they began the process of closing everything up, and we didn't go through. Listen, when a loved one, Saved, they're already alive and they can go to heaven. They did. But their body, this old vessel that's been carrying around, the soul of them, totally gone. It's dead. 
it's been a while. It's not, it's not coming, it's not coming back. Be it sin before salvation, think of it this way, before salvation, sin had dominion over the world. It did. No one wanted to think of whether you saved early or late. Before salvation, sin had dominion over us. But now, but now, after Christ, after we accept the Father's position, after we become in Him or with Him, sin no longer reigns. Sin no longer has power. Sin no longer has control of us. We must abolish it and put it to death. Let me give this illustration. I think I have time, but I'll make the last point. A preacher friend, a preacher friend shared a, a video. And it seems like a while back, it's been a long time ago. Shared a video of, uh, of a lady coming into counseling. And, and one thing pastors uh, need to help their flock do is, is, is counseling. And I think every uh, preacher would, would agree with the statement I'm about to make. The best counseling I'm going to do is to be right there behind that bed. You know, I'm amazed over and over, Lord, how, how people over the years go to pastors for help on situations that they dealt with and were right here behind this desk, but they were not ever received. Figure they could have gotten, but then they reach out. So, anyways, he, he posts this video of, of a lady that comes for, for help. And, and the video is more humorous than I will present this morning, but I just want to get to the truth of it. And the lady comes in, Paul Bell, and he sits down, and, and the guy's very direct with her. Some of you may have seen this, I don't know. The guy's very direct with her. He says, all right, he says, I got five minutes. He said, I only charge five dollars. He said, five minutes. After that, anything after five minutes is free. So she's like, wow, this is pretty cool. They all get on the phone for a minute. Then he looks at her and says, but I'll have to go past five minutes. He says, so I'm going to start the clock, and I want you to begin. Tell me your problem, and I'd like to know what yours is. He says, no. He says, well, he says, this fear of being put in the right place. Okay, now, how many of you are kind of claustrophobic? Have you ever been in a claustrophobic fear? Try to get in a cabin or get in one space out of the fear. Well, she said, I have this fear of being put in the right place. But I mean, all the time, I'm not sure. So he lets it be. And he let her talk, and he, he let her tell how it had been, and how she struggled with it all this time. And then he lets it be. She goes on after after they deal with this, and she mentions some other things. But as she was talking about the very life, he kind of sat back and he asked the question again. And the Becky, this fear was kind of coming over her face. She said, What can I do? He said, Oh, I got an answer for you. He said, I got, I've actually got an answer for you, too. And she started reaching through her pocket. She said, Well, I'll give you a minute. He said, Can you write this down? He said, Well, it's only two words you find that mean the answer. It's only two words. Can she have it in the end of the conversation? Just like that. And just like Becky jumped, this lady sitting in her chair, and she says, she jumps back, and she says, do what? And he said, stop it! And she says, stop it? And he said, yeah. He said, he said, you want victory over the fear of being buried alive? She said, she's like trembling again. He said, okay, stop it! He said, stop fearing that you're going to be buried alive! Sits back down and calls down and says, All right, next problem. Oh, he said, and he actually said, Well, that was only three minutes. He said, We're done. He said, I need five dollars. He said, Well, and you don't get changed, by the way. So she said, Well, since I got two more minutes, I just want a couple more questions. So she asked a couple more things about things she struggled with. And you can guess if you looked at her still more calm, she kind of said, Stop it. She said, No, I, I'm struggling with this, this anger that she said, Stop it. He said, you, you came for victory today, right? She said, well, we did. Yeah. He said, this stop it. He said, you want to leave my office with the same problem? She said, no, I don't want to have the same problem. Said, this stop it. And she mentioned the sin. He said, stop it. And she went on and mentioned another struggle she was having. He said, stop it. And she's looking back and she says, she looks back at him one time and actually says, do you stop it? Just like that. She was fed up. And he said, well, don't you want victory over the sin? I'm like, oh, you're a great brother. I might get knocked back up to the stage. She said, yeah. But he said, just stop the fear. Just stop the fear. Now, practice that with me. All, all three. Let's say stop. I'm serious. One, two, three. There you go. Some of y'all got the, got the little tune going. Listen. 
Some of you need to learn how to say that. Some of us need to learn how to do that. Come on now. Little you, if you get across the point, you're struggling with sin, stop it. Stop it. If the devil's defeating you with a sin in your life, stop it. I mean, it doesn't get much more easier. You continually go back to something that's hurting your sin. Stop it! But you're being so good. Listen, quit. You stop it. But seriously, church, stop it. Learn to say it. And next time somebody comes to you and they want to, whatever, whatever, look at them and say, stop. stop it. Quit. The boss, the boss said, you've got to abolish the old man. And if you want victory in your twisted life, then just stop the sin. Amen. Rob, you can't see me here, can you? Okay, just check it. Good. Good spot there. Just my time. Stop it. Struggle with sin, stop it. You got a sin that's taking you to stop it. Stop it. She didn't like that much that day. But it is what it is. You struggle with something, stop it. The sin keeps reoccurring, stop it. Preach, I can't. Oh, I know you can. Because just as he had power over the dead flesh, coming out of the grave, Paul likes it. You don't think you have power over sin because they have the wrong view of the resurrection. Amen. We can't have the power. We can't have the power. Look at the last part of this verse. We've got to activate his great power. We're talking about power. Power outside the gun of five minutes. Pray for a miracle. Happy to hear the church with that. At least I got the at least I got the Bible before five minutes left. Amen. <laughs> We've got to activate his free power. Now, I use the word activate there because when you work, you look at the word wreck, and I told you before, and I think it shows up 19 times in the book of Romans alone. 40 or 60 times in the New Testament. It means what requires us to say, he has power. We've got to act upon it. Not only do we know. Okay? We know we've got to avoid that false presumption we keep on sinning. Bless God, we know because we're saved, we've been accepted in the promised position. Amen. We know that at Calvary, the old man has been abolished. We've abolished our fatal past. Now, let's activate his free power. This power is made available to us based on his resurrection. So the idea behind the phrase is that we have to act on it. We have to put something into action. And when Jesus rose from the grave, listen, folks, he completely conquered it. Okay, I mean, he acted upon it. It's not just a story we tell. It's not just a gathering we have of come around Resurrection Sunday. That we, no, it, it, it's an actual event. It, it actually happened. He acted upon his resurrection. Think about Lazarus when he goes to the grave. And everybody's mourning four days late. Lord, you're four days late if you'd only been here earlier. Well, listen, when he says Lazarus, come forward, Lazarus didn't keep snoozing, amen? He acted upon it. Why? Because power was given. And I can't tell you, we have been given the power to overcome the power of sin in our life. But we've got to activate it. We've got to activate it. I can tell you one thing Lazarus didn't do. He didn't walk out of that grave and sweat. And see the sun shine and say, well, I think we'll go back in, boys. We'll go back in. I mean, he took the grave clothes off, and he didn't put them back on. He walked out of that grave, and he didn't walk back in. Amen? Man, spiritually speaking, if we can do that, if we can take the grave clothes off, if we can walk out and don't keep walking back in, stop it. Amen? Just stop it. i got to hurry because I'm five minutes down short. Wreck it. Three things he told us here we got to do. we got to wreck it. See this, 11 through 13. Likewise, reckon ye yourselves the dead to be. Let me just tell you quickly of what this means. We use this word a lot today, but when we say I reckon, we mean what? We say, well, I reckon. We mean, I guess, I suppose. It's a many of our time. It means to take account of. To take account, to evaluate and make a judgment. Let me tell you one practical way we do this on a very regular basis around here. What do you do when you're cruising down I-64 and you see one of those big lights on top of the car sitting on the side of the highway? What is your first reaction? If it's great, by the way, don't do it because they're going to get you at that point, okay? They got you. Okay? But our first, we see something and 
talk about you, maybe, maybe this is the Lord I'm having to me, or I feel good. Taking into account, whoa, I just saw the Lord, got to see what the needle says. And we take it into account. Now, some of you know you're going fast, and you do just hit the brakes. I got to slow this just down. That's for my wife. But for the rest of us, for the rest of us, we take into account, and then we grow up. We apply it. We say, whoa, I got to see where I'm at. I'm so happy with Jesus. Jesus is more than just sitting on the side of the road. Amen. I'm asking you to take into account where you're at. Says, I got a greater state because you got it. says, Do not let sin reign in your mortal body. So, what I mean is, don't let Satan, don't let it have control. Don't let it have control. Some of you are fighting sin. Listen, sin, oh my goodness, sin works its way every time. This is the devil. Y'all have to get in some direction to get in This is the devil doing it to make us look good to be good. We eat the ice cream. writing this letter here to say, he would say, stop it, look back. Stop it, look. Don't let sin reign. you got to reckon you can't let it reign with no sound. Give me just a second. No verbal. you got to be good. There's something that God's indicating for us. Verse 13 says, neither yield your members to lust to God or to the power of the sin. The structure of this phrase in the original language meant to stop an act already in progress. We are not to present ourselves to sin. We are not to allow it to constantly reign in our body. It does not do it. Have control of that body. It says, yield to God. Yield. Now, I don't have to mention sin. I don't have to mention the weakness of our body. The Holy Spirit already handles this part. That's what Paul is saying. Don't present the issue of your body to the of your sin. This is the old me part. Stop it. You're not going to leave your members to be used for sin. You're not going to use, allow your members, leave your members to be used for unrighteousness. You need to stop it. You need to realize you're in Him. You're with Him. You have victory over the power of sin, and you can conquer. You can conquer. Bow your head and close your eyes and close your heart. Sin is not your master, my friend. Sin is not your master. And no matter how many times the devil has told you, no matter how many times he or how deep he has his claws in you, sin is not your master. Grace has been delivered and has delivered us from the old man. Therefore, the saved person, we can be in him, with him. And I'm telling you, upon authority of God's word, listen, this morning, I know I, I said some, it, it may got a little hot in here at times this morning, but I, I'm just a mailman. I don't write it. I just deliver it. But if you've got sin in your life and you're struggling with the power of sin, again, None of us are going to live perfect until we get to glorification stage. But if you're struggling with the power, if there's things that recur in your life over and over again, then know this morning God wants you to make a decisive act, come to Jesus, and get victory over the power of sin. God, meet your help this morning. Oh, Lord, your presence is here. Your word has been prophetic. God, I trust you. 